On September 20, 2023, SpaceX stirred up the atmosphere at the Founders Day Parade in McGregor, Texas, leaving onlookers in awe as they showcased a colossal Starship Raptor vacuum engine. The event marked SpaceX's first public appearance at the parade in the small town of McGregor, which has been home to the company's rocket testing facility since 2003. Simultaneously, this is also an opportunity for the company to showcase directly to the public one of the best inventions not only of them but of the entire aerospace industry. Although less talked about than the sea level version, the Raptor vacuum engine is a key component in SpaceX's ambitious plan to return NASA astronauts to the moon and bring humans to Mars by Starship. It explains why this vacuum version of Raptor is engineered with unique and advanced technologies that promise to blow your mind. Find out everything in today's episode of TechMap. A vacuum engine or vacuum-optimized rocket engine refers to a kind of engine dedicated to operation in space. It seems to be against the normal principle of Newton's third law. You know, Rocket engines produce thrust by releasing mass rearward at a very high speed according to Newton's third law, not unlike how discharging a fire extinguisher pushes us backward. Flat earthers claim that rocket engines cannot possibly work in space because space is a vacuum and there is no air to push against. In reality, it is possible to produce thrust in a vacuum by releasing mass that we call propellants rearward at a very high speed. So, how can the vacuum operate efficiently in space without wasting propellants? At a glance, we can see clearly that the vacuum engines have a much larger nozzle than the sea level version as it needs to match the significantly lower air density in the upper atmosphere and the vacuum of space. The hot exhaust gases exiting a rocket's nozzle need to equal the external air pressure to maximize engine efficiency. At sea level, the air pressure is around 1,000 millibars. It quickly decreases with altitude to 100 millibars at 12 kilometers and only 1 millibar at 50 kilometers. This makes it impossible for one single nozzle design to maintain maximum efficiency throughout a launch vehicle's ascent. Fortunately, the principles of fluid dynamics dictate that the pressure of rocket exhaust gases decreases as the surface area of a nozzle increases without a loss in velocity. This means that the bigger or more expanded a rocket nozzle is, the lower the gas pressure. However, a too wide nozzle tends to lead to a phenomenon known as flow separation which happens when the flow of gas inside an engine separates from the nozzle wall. The RS-25 nozzle has an unusually large expansion ratio of about 77.5 per 1 for the chamber pressure. At sea level, a nozzle of this ratio would normally undergo flow separation of the jet from the nozzle, which would cause control difficulties and could even mechanically damage the vehicle. To aid the engine's operation, Rocketdyne engineers varied the angle of the nozzle walls from the theoretical optimum for thrust, reducing it near the exit. This raises the pressure just around the rim to an absolute pressure between 4.6 and 5.7 pounds per square inch, and prevents flow separation. However, meet SpaceX vacuum. The team selected the nozzle size to be at the limit of what can be effectively tested in the atmosphere without encountering significant flow separation issues. It turns out that Raptor vacuum is optimized for development time because they only need to focus on certain design choices to speed up testing and iteration. A notable aspect is the use of copper sheets and Inconel in the manufacturing technique for Raptor nozzles. The process begins with a copper sheet from which channels are machined, creating the desired shape. This copper sheet is then sandwiched between two Inconel sheets, forming the channel walls. This manufacturing approach offers a departure from the laborious process of individually arranging and welding numerous pipes together, which was common for regeneratively cooled nozzles in older engine design. The use of copper and Inconel provides a robust and efficient solution for the Raptor vacuum engine's nozzle construction. In addition to the nozzle size, the specific impulse on the Raptor is also worth noting. In September September 2020, a successful full-duration test of the Raptor vacuum engine at SpaceX's development facility in McGregor, Texas, recorded the mark of approximately 380 seconds of specific impulse. This is even higher than the best Russian engine, the RD-180 with around 338 seconds, and Blue Origin's BE-4, which is expected to have a specific impulse of around 311 seconds. 
For Starship, which has three vacuum engines, the total of specific impulses will be 1,140 seconds, a significant number, right? Not only that, Raptor Vacuum also makes a strong impression with its enormous thrust. Its second version achieved 569,000 pounds of thrust and worked very well in Flight 2. This motivated SpaceX to go further with the third version. Although the detail around Raptor Vacuum 3 has not been revealed yet, we are sure that its thrust will be increased much to be able to shock everyone. It would be a game-changer for Starship in its missions in the deep space. This is due to the efficiency of the full-flow staged combustion cycle on which the Raptor operates and the methane propellant that it consumes. A full-flow staged combustion cycle is difficult to develop, but it can produce energy extremely efficiently. Being a full-flow means there's a fuel-rich turbopump and an oxygen-rich turbopump, with the output from both turbopumps combined in the chamber. Decryomethalox means a lower mass of fuel and oxygen produces more thrust, as long as they operate at the same temperature and chamber pressure, but SpaceX is also increasing those parameters. When all of those things are combined into a real rocket, the only loss is we get a much larger rocket, because methane is much less dense than rapone, even under extremely cold temperatures. The empty rocket mass ends up higher to accommodate the larger tanks, but the lower methane mass much more than makes up for that in mass. Meanwhile, the ERD-180 used closed-cycle staged combustion fueled by rich liquid oxygen and kerosene, BE-4 is an oxygen-rich liquefied methane-fueled staged combustion rocket engine. Unlike some normal rockets which just install one vacuum engine in the second stages, SpaceX still prioritizes using many engines, including three vacuum and three sea level at the present prototype. Although this boosts the spacecraft more power, it further heats the temperature in the engine area up easily causing catastrophic explosions. So, the company has applied a method, namely regenerative cooling to cool down Raptor. Elon also mentioned it in his tweet in June 2017, will be full regenerative cooled all the way out to the 3 meter 10 FD nozzle diameter. Heat flux is nuts and radiative view factor is low. Regenerative cooling, in the context of rocket engine design, is a configuration in which some or all of the propellant is passed through tubes, channels, or in a jacket around the combustion chamber or nozzle to cool the engine. This is effective because the propellants are often cryogenic. The heated propellant is then fed into a special gas generator or injected directly into the main combustion chamber. In the case of Raptor, this system is utilized to prevent heat transfer from the Raptor vacuum's nozzle to the surrounding skirt. In this system, methane, the propellant used by the engine, is pumped through the walls of the nozzle, effectively cooling it during firing. This approach is necessary because, unlike the Merlin vacuum engine, where the nozzle is exposed to space, the vacuum nozzle is situated within the skirt. Thus, it is essential to maintain a cool nozzle without vertently heating the surrounding structure. As a result, heat flux is nuts and the radiative view factor is low. Heat flux is the rate of heat transfer per unit area or delivered by the exhaust to the bell. In this context, the radiative view factor is how much empty cold space is visible to the bell with a single vacuum engine completely uncovered as is typical in a second stage. All parts of the bell are exposed to the cold vacuum of space. If the heat flux is low enough, you can simply choose material materials for the bell that will survive temperatures that will radiate heat at the same rate as the exhaust's heat flux goes into the bell. Space is cold and nigh infinite, so no heat comes back and the bell will withstand a steady state condition. With the Raptor vacuum, they're surrounded by other Raptor vacuums, so any heat that gets radiated away is radiated back. Also, those on one side are next to a heat shield, which will heat up and radiate heat back to the engine bell. Thus, you can't use radiation cooling for the engine bell, and that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.